Good afternoon and welcome to the EFC webinar on pornography as a public health crisis. My name is Karen Stiller and I'm an editor with Faith Today magazine. I'd like to begin today by actually apologizing for uh, the postponement of this webinar from last week. Uh, we appreciate your patience and we're grateful that you've joined us today. We're going to be discussing today the price of the widespread use of pornography to our society. Pornography is more accessible, more graphic, and more violent than it has ever been. What can our churches and concerned parents do? We're joined today by Julia Beasley, Director of Public Policy for the Evangelical Fellowship of Canada, and Glenn Dean Girard, Director of Defend Dignity, an organization that exists to end all sexual exploitation in Canada. In a minute, I'm going to ask our guests to introduce themselves and share with us why and how they're experts uh, on this topic, and then we'll dive right in. I really want to invite you today as participants at home or in your office, wherever you are, to send in your questions and be participants. Use the chat function on your screen uh, to type in questions and we will try, try to deal with them as we move along. So welcome and let's begin. Julia, why don't you start and then Glendine join in. Sure. Uh, as Karen said, I'm the Director of Public Policy at the EFC, and we have been engaged for a number of years in addressing issues of sexual exploitation. This is fun for Glendine and I to do together because we've been partnering on this for a number of years. And we arrived at the issue of pornography um, through our work fighting prostitution and sex trafficking and starting to look at some of the root causes and what is driving this and how do we get upstream of the problems we're trying to deal with. And uh, that's how we arrived at the question of pornography. Hi, thanks, Karen. And yeah, it is a privilege to be here with Julia because we do so much work together. Uh, because our organization exists to end all sexual exploitation uh, in Canada, then you absolutely have to look at the issue of pornography because we see it as digital prostitution. And as Julia said, it's, uh, it's a root cause and you just can't get very far looking at all the other forms of sexual exploitation without bumping into pornography every time you turn around. Uh, and as she said, it's, it's a root cause. It feeds and fuels the demand uh, for other forms of sexual exploitation. So it's just an issue that we have to tackle head on. Let's uh, define some terms. Why uh, this idea of pornography as a public health crisis, I think is a new way of thinking about this problem for people. So can you uh, tell us, first of all, what is a public health crisis, Glendine, and why is it important to call pornography that? What, what does that do for the discussion? Well, I think it's a public health crisis uh, because actually I'm going to use a quote from a, a presenter that we're bringing into Ottawa next week to speak on Parliament Hill. We've met with this gal a, a few times and she says it really well. She says that pornography is a social issue because the harm it creates affects individuals or groups beyond their capacity to correct it. So, you know, when I think of myself as a mom, as a grandma, I can put... Uh, uh, filters on my computers, I can do some things to protect my kids, my grandchildren from it, but when they step outside of my home and they're in the broader world around us, uh, what happens then? Who's, who's out to protect them then? Um, so other examples of public health issues include things like immunization, motor vehicle safety and smoking. And the idea is that once we see something as a social issue or a public issue, that sort of shifts the responsibility from just the affected individual. And then we start looking at broader uh, external social or causes and influences and holding those things accountable. So again, um, Cordelia speaks often of pornography um, and compares it to smoking. And she says, you know, once we began, first of all, we began to recognize that there were in fact harmful effects on the individuals who were smoking. So the approach initially was to start educating people, encourage them to stop smoking. But over time, despite all the protests from the industry, it became apparent that smoking was not just affecting the smoker. It had impacts on non-smokers as well. It became clear that it was addictive, all of these things. So then this public health response was initiated. Now we have piles of research that show us that pornography is harmful, not just to the individual user, but also to the public, 
to our society. And so it's time for a societal response to this as well. As Glendine said, um, Gail Dines, who's someone else we work with on this issue, she says, individual families can't protect their kids from pornography. That's like telling parents to stop their kids from breathing polluted air. So we're working to communicate clearly to our government the ways that pornography is harming the health of individuals and of society and calling for a strategy that is broad based and multi multidisciplinary to address it. Okay, let's uh, talk about some sorry specific um, consequences to society. Then I think we can, and we can talk about individual impact as well. But I think we can all guess what some of those are. But when we're talking about society, um, unpack some of those impacts. So just to build on the public health idea, first of all, we know that pornography has never been so widely accessible to, by adults or by children. And this is due to the advent of, of internet, particularly high speed wireless internet. It is virtually accessible anywhere, anytime. Um, and it can be found either with intent or just by accident. So it's actually really hard to avoid. Um, and it's never been what it is today. Today's pornography is violent. It's profoundly degrading and body punishing. And that's really important to understand because it teaches all kinds of harmful and dishonest lessons about sex, about men and women, about the ways that they can and should and do relate to each other. Um, it teaches things like sex is not about intimacy, caring, love, respect, mutuality, that sex is adversarial. It's kind of a you know, it's a it's an adversarial thing that violence in sex is normal and desirable, um, that non consensual sex is normal. It sends the message that the primary function of a woman is to serve as an object for sexual pleasure. It normalizes extreme forms of objectification, um, sexual violence against women. And we know that internet pornography in particular is a powerful teacher. It has a profound impact on the brain, especially on the developing brain. And I think we've talked before how we know that the average age of first exposure to online pornography is between 10 and 12 years of age. And the reality is that most kids by the time they're 16 have seen pornography online, some of them as young as eight years old and sometimes younger. And we have this growing body of research that paints the picture of the harmful effects of pornography on the developing brain, on the ability to form healthy relationships, and on, like I said, the ways we think about and relate to the opposite, opposite sex. Um, we know it has a profound influence on sexual conditioning. So that's sort of what arouses us, how we become aroused. Um, it shapes attitudes. It leads to sexual dysfunction at increasingly younger ages. Um, it shapes expectations and relationships. And for sure, we know now that it leads to compulsive behavior and addiction. So we say it's a public health crisis because it affects all dimensions of health, um, physical, emotional, psychological, relational, and spiritual, but also because its effects extend beyond just the individual who is watching the pornography um, to everyone else. You know, we have a pornified culture, uh, themes of extreme objectification are everywhere. This contributes to what we call rape culture and this culture in which um, bodies and sexuality are just considered commodities and sexual exploitation is rampant. So that sort of in a nutshell is the big picture. How do you uh, counter the argument about the personal freedom element of watching porn that people think, oh, it's just something individuals do in their home, and but clearly it affects all of us. Um, do you get pushback on that? You know, I think we get a little bit of pushback on that, but increasingly I'm really delighted to, to see and, and hear people recognizing the harms. I think because um, so far in Canada, child abuse, anything to do with kids being affected is still seen as a really taboo, awful thing. And so when we when we recognize just how ubiquitous pornography is, how easily accessible it is um, by our kids, then people, people get uh, concerned about that, right? And so so the pushback is there for sure by some, but I think as soon as you 
frame the argument and we need to protect our children from its harms, uh, then I think it's much more acceptable and easy to easy to move forward. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned before about getting upstream on some of the issues and the impacts. And I know uh, you've both spoken before about the connections between pornography and human trafficking and prostitution. And in fact, that's what I guess brought you to this issue. So can you unpack that for us? What what are the connections? So we talk about how the sex industry is a seamless interconnected continuum. That's what all the experts say. And pornography is absolutely foundational to it. Um, as Glendine said, it's prostitution with a camera in the room. Mm. Uh, it quite often involves the use of women who've actually been trafficked or coerced, and it feeds the demand for paid sex, which of course, as we have been saying for years, is what funnels women into prostitution. Um, we talked earlier about how the internet has made pornography so accessible. So it's also made it affordable and anonymous, what we call the three A's that drive demand. Demand for more and more violent pornography and demand for paid sex. Um, so Glendine, I think we'll talk a little bit about a study that shows us how porn is often the why for buying sex. Mm -hmm. um, the sexual entitlement that's taught in porn legitimizes the buying of sex and the idea that women should be available for purchase. And because what much of the much of what they see in pornography is um, it's, it's things that either they don't want to ask their partners to do or their partners are not willing to do. They go to the one group of women who can't say no, and that's the prostituted. So Glendine can talk about um, a study that was done here that sort of reinforces this connection. Yeah, there was a great little uh, white paper, it's called, that came out of Calgary from uh, a gal uh, researcher there. And she did some investigating with uh, John schools. So a John school is, uh, they take place in certain cities in Canada, not everywhere. I wish they were everywhere. But uh, so instead of uh, getting a fine or being uh, sent to jail, uh, a person that purchases sex has the option to attend a John school. So it's a day long sort of rehabilitative um, day where they can listen to survivors speak, uh, parents who have lost kids to trafficking, uh, health nurses, all that kind of stuff. So this researcher um, posed the question to, to all, the, all of the, those that were participating in a John school uh, in two locations over a period of months. And sure enough, uh, it showed a, a huge link to pornography uh, fueling their desire to go and purchase a woman. So in every single case, uh, all, of the, all of the Johns uh, were frequent consumers of pornography. And uh, so that, you know, that's, that's a great um, research study that certainly points to the link that exists between pornography and, and the actual purchasing of sex. But, you know, even beyond that, uh, Defend Dignity works closely with five to six survivors and every single one of them uh, has told us that pornography was made of them uh, when they were in the industry. It's also talked about the fact that it was used to groom them before they were ever sexually exploited. Uh, in some cases, uh, some of the guys would bring pornography into the room and say, this is what I want you to do. I mean, it's just uh, tightly woven into every, every single form of sexual exploitation. So yeah, I think that there's a huge, a huge link. Um, another gal that we just met actually at a conference in the states was telling me that uh most of her her porn producers were also really pimps they would expect her to sell herself to different clients um so it, it's like i say it's just uh, part and parcel of the whole the whole sexual exploitation issue yeah the other you know and in fact in a lot of cases the filming of pornography is sex trafficking whether the whether the woman is there willingly or not because most girls when they come to pornography they have a list of things that they will not do they're mm -hmm. not willing to do these certain things but the reality is that they're forced to do things on that list all the time we've heard of all kinds of cases where that happens on the very first shoot so every time that happens it meets the definition of an act of sex trafficking. And as Glendine said, the pornographer controls actions, positions, partners, everything in the same way that a pimp does. So it's, you know, you can just see, it's really, it's all the same thing. 
Uh, just a reminder to people uh, viewing the webinar that you can send in questions anytime using the chat function on your screen. Uh, let's get practical. Um, when we first, as parents, purchased a computer for our children, we followed the advice to keep it in a you know central area. So there it sits abandoned on our kitchen counter because of course they have phones now which are like mini computers so i'm wondering uh if we can move into the move into the home what can parents do to help protect their boys and their girls from this do you want to start <laughs> <laughs> well i'm i'm a firm believer in accountability software um filtering software that's now available uh, through different companies. The company that we recommend is Covenant Eyes. Uh, they've got some excellent uh, resources out there for parents to use. You know, Google, I think, what is it called? Uh, Kids Google now. Uh, thankfully, they've come out with that. And that's a search engine that you can have on your phones, your computers, your devices that will automatically filter out some of the bad stuff. Uh, so it's really looking hard into some of those things. And, you know, they all have a bit of a cost, but I think it's it's really well worth it in the end to invest that kind of money to at least protect the devices that your family has. Mm -hmm. And I am a firm believer in talking to our kids. Um, I, I agree with Glendine Covenant Eyes. There are good things out there that we can and should do to try and protect our kids. Mm -hmm. But just as importantly, I think we need to equip them to make good decisions if and when they are exposed. So that starts at home. So. I think our first and best line of defense is open and honest communication. I first started talking with my son about pornography when he was nine, which sounds nuts, but it wasn't too soon as it turned out because that year he was in grade five, I guess. He had classmates who were already looking at pornography online and encouraging the other boys to look at it too. We know lots of cases of kids as young as eight or nine years old who are addicted to pornography. So for my son and I, that was the first talk of many. And I think that's important. We have to get away from the idea of the dreaded sex talk. Um, in this mm -hmm. culture with all of the influences around us and the way things change so quickly, it just can't be a one-time event. It has to be an ongoing conversation. And, and it's one that I'm afraid the reality is has to start much earlier than most of us might like. So my son is 12 now, and I'm really thankful that he will still ask me anything, you know, anything. Um, and I try to be very honest and scientific in my answers and after every awkward and often hilarious conversation, I just, I thank God mm -hmm. that he came to me instead of going to Google because mm -hmm. that's where we go for our answers, right? Because I know what he would find if he did go there. Mm -hmm. And if our kids are comfortable coming to us with their questions, they may be less likely to go to the internet or to their peers who are getting their information from the internet. And it's so important that we be the safe places they can come with their questions, um, their curiosities, and know that they will find safe and honest answers. Because if we don't tell them, everything else in our culture will. Um, and you don't have to go it alone. There are some good resources out there that can help you. Um, there's a group named Educate Empower Kids that have a great series of books called 30 Days of Sex Talks. I'll hold them up so you can see. Um, there's three different age groups. These are geared to really start the conversation. They're fun, they're colorful, uh, they're very accessible. Um, they have also developed a book on how to talk to your kids about pornography, which is excellent. Mm -hmm. um, we recommend that as well. And for younger kids, there's a great book called Good Pictures, Bad Pictures. Um, this helps kids understand why pornography is harmful and equips them with a plan. So what do you do if you see this? I'm not sure if the camera switched to Glendine or not, but if it didn't, I'll get her to hold it up again. <laughs> yeah, so the, yeah. There it is. Good. Yeah. Yeah. And another thing, too, is as a parent or concerned citizen, um, you can advocate for good filtering in public places. So we may not realize that most libraries, a lot of schools, don't have good filtering in place. And so we can go in and we can say, listen, is there filtering here? If not, what are you going to do about it? Um, 
it's it's you know it's simple we need to be advocating for our children in those regards so are you saying julie that sometimes when kids stumble upon pornography online it is by accident because they're researching a question they have they're trying to answer a question that they're maybe too embarrassed to speak to their parent about Oh, well, that I wouldn't call accidental. I mean, that's just the way the internet is. If you Google anything sexual, you're going to come up with pornography. But yeah, a lot of kids go to the internet because they're curious, they have a question, and they're looking for answers, and that's just what we do. Okay. When you have a question, you go to the internet. But a lot of it is incidental, too. So a kid can be doing homework, doing completely harmless research. They can be playing a game. They can be on YouTube. And I mean, it's happened to most adults, right? Something pops up that's unexpected. There's an ad or a pop-up or something. It's really easy for kids to be exposed to this material online. Yeah. Well, isn't there in fact uh, a porn site that is has got the words White House in it? And purposely <laughs> they did that because, um, right? They knew that that was going to be a, a searched for very, very often searched for term and so now you know, right the porn world has just capitalized on that yeah and they so, capitalize on Disney names and, and yeah, they're, they're yeah. very deliberate mm -hmm. in their marketing so. yeah in fact the whole cartoon uh, porn mm -hmm. genre is just is just skyrocketing around the world uh, again because the porn industry knows that if they can get kids hooked as young as seven eight nine they've got them right they've got them for years ahead and so uh, it's, it's a, a lot of it revolves around the money, of course, that they're all making. And so they're going to do anything to keep, uh, to get kids young and to keep them as long as they can. So the Just, hope is that this young child will turn into a paying customer later on, yeah. you're saying? Yeah. Okay, uh, we do have a question from a viewer, is pornography addictive? And I guess I would add, add to that, you know, how, how, how and why does it become addi literally addictive? I understand with tobacco how it's addictive, but how is porn? So the answer is yes. Um, it is addictive, and uh, that has to do with the way it activates our brains. Um, young people are especially vulnerable, as they are with all addictions, they're especially vulnerable to pornography addiction um, because the parts of the brain that are activated by pornography are fully developed by the time we're, you know, we're children, we're young, they're developed. But the parts of the brain that are able to kind of moderate impulsive behavior and pleasure seeking and all of that don't develop until we're in our early 20s. So Gail Dines, I think it was Gail who said that teenage brains are all gas pedal, no brakes mm -hmm. when it comes to watching pornography. Um, you combine that with hormonal changes, you know, that start around the age of 12, and it just creates this, plus the perfect learning environment that pornography provides. So it, uh, yeah, it just creates this mess. And there have been all kinds of studies done that look at the brains of people who are compulsive porn users and find that they light up and they respond to pornography yeah. in the same ways that um, those of individuals do to drugs or whatever it is they're addicted to. So there's increasing evidence now that it is in fact an addiction. and People can recover, they do recover, um, but it's a similar process. You have to go cold turkey, you have to, it takes time and they're finding that the younger people become addicted, the recovery process takes longer and it's more difficult, but it is still possible. Mm. And that's because their brains have, you know, been conditioned a certain way. There's two, two sources of information that you might want to Google and look into more. Don Hilton is a neurosurgeon uh, from Texas, has done extensive research on all of that, as well as uh, Norman Doig, who is a prof at uh, Toronto University. He's written a book called The Brain That Changes Itself, and he's got a whole section in there on the, why the brain is so vulnerable to the porn addiction. Okay, let's say there's someone in our life, maybe it's our child or our, sometimes it's a husband or wife, I guess, too, um, who is addicted, what, or we suspect might be, what, what does a person do? Do you, do you confront? Do you go off to a therapist with the person and hope they agree? Like, what, what, what are the first steps? Yeah, I think having a conversation about the harms that's, that are there, I mean, um, it's pretty likely that whoever 
this person is, if there really is an addiction in place, they're going to be fully aware that there is an addiction. Hmm. You know, pornography addiction is no different than any other form of addiction, whether it's alcohol or drugs or anything else. There's compuls compulsivity. Um, they have to have more and more different varieties to get the same kind of response. So there's all those similar symptoms uh, that will be, I think, very clear to the individual that is, is addicted. So uh, for certain, having just a, a conversation, I mean, as with any other addiction, it's got to be up to the person that's uh, addicted to want to make a change. And so there's good counseling available. There's uh, uh, different organizations and groups that are helpful. Uh, Celebrate Recovery is, uh, is, is held in a number of churches I, I'm aware of, and they cover all sorts of life addictions and pornography certainly one of them so uh, getting involved in a group like that is good uh, absolutely there's going to be accountability that has to happen so again the whole software thing so how that works is if you sign up for uh, covenant eyes that means uh, if i do that with one other accountability person that means that the report of whatever I'm watching on my computer is going to be sent to that other individual and it will flag anything that's uh, of a pornography nature and then the same thing in return. So you can set that up as well. Uh, so those are some things that uh, you know you could put in place right away. So we have, um, we've been doing reveal forums together across the country and in a lot of cities wherever possible we're partnering with Journey Canada and they have some good people in a lot of cities that can help mm -hmm. individuals who are struggling with this. Yeah. Um, there is an organization called Fight the New Drug. Um, it's very, it's a great, I just recommend that any parent who wants to have an idea of how to talk to kids about this or wants something to show to their kids, it's completely geared to young people, it's, uh, it's edgy, it's accessible, it's got a really sort of aspirational message. You may have seen people walking around with t-shirts that say porn kills love. So they do a really great job of communicating to young people on this issue. They also have a free online recovery program called Fortify. And it's free up until the age of 23, Glendine, is that right? Yeah, in the 20s, yeah. Yeah, um, and it's an excellent resource. The only piece that is missing from it, as Glendine, Glendine said, is accountability. So um, you don't have necessarily that accountability relationship built in, which is really helpful for anyone who's trying to recover from anything, if, you're, if you have some kind of accountability relationship. But but in terms of the, the meat of the program, it's, it's a really good one. What about uh, congregations then? Like, uh, I guess a pastor could preach on this more regularly, you know, sort of, I, I understand that there must be a level of shame attached to this addiction that you might yeah. not get with other typical addictions. So what can a, a church leader do? What can churches do? What can you know, life groups do uh, to help with this issue as well? Well, you know, first of all, just be sure that you've got a plan. Um, Josh McDowell's done extensive research on this. In fact, he hired Barna in the States to do uh, the biggest research project ever on pornography and it was just released this summer. And, you know, he, he said this, our churches will self-destruct if we don't address porn because he recognizes it as such a massive problem, uh, not just out there in culture, but certainly uh, right within our own churches. In fact, his research found that 72% of Christian men, Christian men access porn and 56% of Christian women. Wow. So those are pretty high numbers. And uh, another staggering statistic is that 87% of 18 to 24 year old uh, Christian young people think that it's okay. So um, that's, you know, we, when we hear those kind of statistics, then absolutely, I think pastors, church leadership need to recognize how important it is to address it and to put a plan in place. So the plan, certainly, as you said, Karen, needs to be, we need to talk about it. So whether it's preaching on a Sunday morning, whether it's uh, having a small group uh, study about it, whether it's, you know, whatever way in which we want to do it, for sure, it needs to be talked about during premarital counseling. Uh, we need to get it out in the open, and I think once we do that in a safe and non-judgmental way, then the whole shame thing is hopefully going to dissipate a little bit. Uh, because when we recognize that it is an addiction, 
uh, that it isn't going to, it doesn't need to define who you are as a person, uh, but rather churches just need to have a listening ear and an openness to, to love and extend grace and then offer ways to help. So some of the things that we've already talked about, right? Uh, celebrate recovery, think through that, right? You don't want to just one day decide you're going to preach about it and then have nothing in place for the fallout that might happen because of it. So you need to be prepared that there will be people that are sort of all along that continuum of either just dabbling occasionally to watching it monthly to being really addicted to it. Uh, and so how are you going to address all of those different groups of people? And don't don't uh, reference it as just a male problem. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the stats, as I just said, 56 Christian, 56 percent of Christian women are viewing it. And so we need to talk about it as an everybody's problem. And uh, I think especially for women, if we, if we name it only as a male problem and I'm struggling with it as a woman, then how much deeper the shame, right? Because it's something that I shouldn't be struggling with and yet I am. And so, uh, yeah, really, really talking about it as everybody's problem. And then, you know, we've already talked about some of the things we need to do with parents to help educate them uh, with how they talk to their kids about it. I think that's a responsibility for the church as well. You know, kid past, kids pastors, how are they addressing it or what, what are they doing to help uh, their parents know how to talk about it and deal with it? And uh, yeah, making covenant eyes available, all of those kinds of things that we need to, uh, that we need to put into place. Um, churches really need to be having a plan. I, I think Glendine mentioned this. It's called the porn phenomenon. Uh, it's available online, and Josh McDowell is very generous with it. He will just send it to anybody, and I think that it's required reading for all pastors. Yeah. But as Glendine said, it highlights two things. So it shows how many people in the church are struggling with it, um, but it also shows this sort of ambivalence on the issue among younger people. And so what's going on there? And and some of that is just the fact that it is so ubiquitous and it's and it's everywhere and it, and it's our culture is steeped in it really. So for most young people growing up, it's no big deal because it's everywhere. But I think some of that is you know we need to do a better job of helping Christians understand why pornography is problematic. For so long, we've just talked about how watching porn is sinful, and we haven't really dug much deeper than that. Why? Why is it? I mean, the full answer to the question, why? What's at the root of this sinfulness? And we have to help people understand the big picture that pornography is not just, it's, it's not just something that's between you and your laptop or your mobile or be, even just between you and God. Um, it affects those you're in relationship with. It affects your family members, your partner, your spouse. Uh, it shapes attitudes, preferences, and behaviors. It shapes the culture we live in. And it's the root of all of these other forms of sexual exploitation. So we have to really dig deep into this issue and help people understand the fullness of it. Um, because as long as it's kept as just, it's only something that really affects me, um, I think we're missing missing some of some of the answer to the problem. And you know, Karen, the other the other group in this whole church side of things that we we need to um, bring out into the open, I guess, is the spouse of the person that's mm -hmm. addicted. So whether it's the husband or the wife, uh, what are we going to do, and how are we going to help them? Mm -hmm. You know, again, research is telling us that spouses of addicted. Um, Pornography users have trauma, as they're calling it PTSD. That's the level of trauma that they're feeling. Uh, the betrayal, the, the hurt, um, all of that that comes along with, with your spouse being addicted, is it's real. And so again, you know, what are we doing as churches to identify that and to have good responses and again, bring it out in the open so it's an okay thing for a wife to come and say, well, even if my husband doesn't want to get help, I need help mm -hmm. because this is what I'm facing. And then one other quick uh, resource that I've just come across in the last few weeks, uh, it's called Purity is Possible. It's, uh, it's in process and it's meant for youth workers or parents to use to come alongside kids that are struggling with pornography. And uh, it's a seven week sort of guide 
Uh, you can access it through truthmatters.ca uh, under their resources. And they're still, it's still in development stages, but they're actually looking for input from all of us that are using it to, uh, to make it as good as it can be. So again, just delighted that church groups are recognizing they need to have good responses and that uh, it's a tool that, that's uh, a good tool, I think, that we can be using. You mentioned these reveal events you've been holding. Um, like, are, can churches still join in on that? Can do you come and do presentations? Can you explain that? Yeah, it's a half a day conference. Uh, we've uh, done it either as breakout sessions with a couple plenaries, or we can do it all as plenary sessions. Really wide open to how we do it. Uh, basically, we cover uh, three, three, and working on a fourth different sessions. One is called parenting and porn. One is this very issue we're talking about today. Why is pornography a public health crisis and how can you engage in uh, helping culture change it? And then the other one is the effects of pornography on your relationships. And we do a chunk in there on what is happening to your brain, what is the whole addictive cycle that happens, and then what are the ramifications with it, with, uh, with your relationships. So yeah, it's a conference that we're doing. The next one we're doing uh, is in February in Edmonton at Beulah Alliance Church on February 12th. And then we have another one slated for Oshawa in April. We don't have a date yet, but um, we'll go wherever people would like us to come and uh, just educate and provide resources uh, for churches that way. And you mentioned uh, at the beginning uh, event an event coming up. I know it's Ottawa specific, but maybe you can explain that uh, event as well. If someone is in the Ottawa area, they might be able to help spread the word and it will give us ideas too of what we could maybe do in our own area. Sure. On um, November 29th, we are, as we said, we're bringing Cordelia Anderson. She's an expert in public health, particularly pornography is a public health issue. She also has devoted her life to um, promoting healthy sexual development in children and protecting kids from exploitation. So she has a really, a really great understanding of the issue. Um, we're bringing her to Ottawa to speak to parliamentarians. So there will be two events on the 29th for MPs and senators, and uh, it would really help us. It would be fantastic if everyone watching would contact their MP and ask them to be sure to attend. Um, sometimes they can just pop in for 10 minutes, but even that is something she will provide an evidence-based presentation. Um, what is the research telling us and what can we do? Um, so both Defend Dignity and EFC have some uh, resources on our websites. If you just sort of need some language that will help you communicate with your MP, what am I asking them? <laughs> what, what do I want to say? Mm -hmm. So we both have that material on our website. If people want to um, reach out to their MP and do that, that would be really helpful. Okay, great. Um, as we enter into the last few moments, uh, we have a viewer who has asked why this is why it's problematic. And so I think let's swing back to how we began the webinar when we talked about, you know, why why we're calling it a public health crisis. So if you could just summarize again what some of the negative impacts are. We're looking at each other. Um, so again, <laughs> I want to hear from both of you. <laughs> I, I wonder if what if what the viewer is picking up on was my comment that we need to do a better job than just saying watching porn is sinful. I think right. we've talked about a lot of the um, the negative effects on kids as they develop uh, their sort of sexual worldview, how it's harming them that way. Um, we didn't really, I guess, get into the kinds of attitudes and behaviors that result from porn use. Um, so studies of men, uh, not necessarily addicted, but just who watch a lot of pornography will show, um, uh, for example, increased belief in rape myths. So this is things like uh, women don't really suffer from rape. Mm -hmm. um, she wanted what she got what she wanted when she was raped that women enjoy rape that women make false accusations of rape all the time that kind of thing we know also that um, they will be more likely to hold an adversarial view of sex to view women as objects to be more accepting of sexual violence to be more likely to want sex without emotional involvement uh, to be more involved in forced or coercive sex so on and so on we talked about um, the connection with 
with prostitution, be more likely to visit prostitutes and how that fuels sexual exploitation. Um, we didn't really talk about changing tastes and preferences, but Glendine alluded to it with pornography use. Uh, different from drug use, you don't need more, you need different. Yeah, yeah. So we see people who use a lot of more and more deviant. Yeah. deviating to material that probably when they started out, they would have found despicable or disgusting. So we see a lot of deviation to child pornography, yeah. which often leads to offending. So there's that whole side to it. Um, and I just meant, you know, like, oh yeah, consent. I mean... <laughs> So in pornography, women never say no, and if they do, they do it anyway, and they're portrayed as enjoying it. So we see this playing out all over the place, in the media, in bars, on campuses, this idea that uh, no really means yes, or it means maybe, or it means, you know, just do it anyway, because at the, in, the, in the end, I'm going to enjoy it. So we have all of these things that are just coming into play. Um, we've had, you know, a few weeks ago in Ottawa, we had this pub crawl, sex for points pub crawl, where participants had to engage in sex acts with the judges or with other participants for points. We've had the Dalhousie dentistry student scandal, um, the Stanford rape case. I mean, we just see all of these things playing out. And where is this coming from? Why, where are kids learning this? Is, have kids just suddenly gone bad? And, and we're arguing that no, they are getting their education from pornography and they are just playing out what they've been taught. Yeah. Um, and we have to put a stop to that. And at some point, and I think people are starting to wake up and realize where is all of this behavior coming from? We have to take a look at what's causing it. They are just doing what they've been taught. Um, we can talk about all the effects on young girls, what it teaches them as they're growing up. Yeah. We heard, just to summarize very, very briefly, girls learn that the most important thing about them is their sex appeal, whether or not they are sexually desirable. Their bodies are what matter. And this causes them to self-objectify. We see that on any social media site. Um, they learn to treat their bodies as something that exists to please others. And what are all of those effects? And at this conference that Glendine mentioned earlier, we heard a woman who had struggled with pornography addiction, and she said it really powerfully. She said, porn is grooming the next generation of trafficking victims, mm -hmm. girls who will traffic themselves. Mm -hmm. They will give themselves over to abuse and exploitation just because they think that's what they're supposed to do. So that's a big... That wasn't a very brief answer or summary. No, that's but very helpful. Some stuff we didn't really get to. <laughs> I hope yep. that answers the question. Go ahead. I don't Andy. know. I don't know that we have we talked yet about the whole erectile dysfunction thing. I mean, that's another. It's this is a huge issue that's beginning to happen uh, with young guys, right? So at the very age where this should never be happening, it's happening, yeah. and. Uh, so that's another fallout. Yeah, um, an actual you, physical consequence. An actual of, physical consequence. Yeah. And there's now millions of guys on different websites talking to each other about how they can overcome this and yeah. recognizing um, that they have to, that, that porn is the factor. And once they get help for that and get off of porn, then their bodies function as they're meant to, to function. So that's a huge issue. The other uh, interesting research that I'm uh, reading and following uh, is the whole bystander thing so that um, what they're seeing now is because pornography has so infiltrated uh, our young people that when there is a rape or some other horrible thing happening to a girl on a campus uh, they're they're actually seeing that bystanders are not they're just watching they're just seeing it happen in front of them and not intervening because again uh, the message from porn is that the girl wants it that even if she says no uh, she really means yes and therefore, you know, there's nothing to intervene with. And so, uh, yeah, Dr. John Fubert in the States has done a lot of research on this whole thing. And so, you know, we just see it infiltrating everything, everywhere. Let's, uh, let, as we end, let's uh, try to find some hope. <laughs> You've offered uh, both really a wonderful list of resources, which I think at our end uh, we'll try to list off and put it in a blog post perhaps. So, um people can tap into those a little more easily. Uh, I'm wondering, uh, in, it's so much of it is an online issue. Is there anything legally that is happening that we can be a part of? And just if you could both uh, give a final comment uh, for our viewers. 
Well, we're, we're launching uh, something in February, so stay tuned. Uh, we're calling our campaign Choose Change. And we're actually engaging five different companies, organizations from different sectors. So we've got a retailer, an internet service provider, a hotel chain, a restaurant chain, uh, and a library association in the country. And we are uh, going to invite the public to join us by sending emails to the CEOs, the directors of these organizations, and asking them to stop or change the current practice that they now do. So for instance, you know, there's restaurant chains that offer public Wi-Fi, and yet they've not put good filtering on that public Wi-Fi. So you can go into their restaurant or their coffee shop or wherever it is and access all of that. Um, so that's, for instance, one of the things that we're going to be doing. Now, that's not changing anything in a legal way, but if we can start to get companies and organizations uh, stopping and changing. I mean, in the research we're doing for libraries across the country, there are very, very few library associations, if you can believe it, that have actually installed filtering. Yeah. And I, in our research, we've come across story after story of either library workers or kids or parents stumbling on pornography that's left wide open on somebody's computer screen in there. Wow. So those are some of the things that we're trying to see uh, change. And then we've got a whole list of things that we want to talk to the government about. And maybe, Julie, I'll let you jump in and, and talk about some of those. Sure. So obviously, we think at this point, our best strategy is to promote this awareness of pornography as a public health crisis. Um, the research speaks for itself. And I think that once there's this understanding of the devastating effects on individuals, on culture, on kids, on society, there will be a will to do something about it. Um, so we have some ideas and we're, we're um, eager first to get the research on the table before uh, law and policymakers, before educators, before health professionals. Um, and then we can pursue things like filtering. Um, in the UK, they require um, service providers at the provider level to block pornographic content. So rather than what we have here where you have to figure out how to opt out of this content coming into your home, instead, if you're an adult, you can opt in to the content. Um, we can work on requiring age verification. Most of these sites, there is absolutely no, if there's even a click here if you're 18, which there isn't on a lot of them, it means nothing, right? Anybody can click that and say, sure, I'm over 18. Um, uh, Defend Dignity is working on the idea of warning labels. We put warning labels on cigarettes and on, you know, saying this is harmful to your health. Is there any way to, to do a campaign or to put labels on pornography that says this is, this is potentially very harmful to your health? Um, so there's all kinds of things like that. Something else that is interesting there was an article in The Economist um, a while back about a company named MindGeek moving their head offices to Canada. So they've had offices here in Montreal for a while, but they're moving their kind of main operations to Canada. And at first I was really sort of depressed about this. <laughs> and then I thought, you know what? This is actually a good thing because we're seeing some will in Parliament. We've been working hard to promote uh, MP Arnold Bearson's motion M47, which would require the Health Committee to study this as a health issue. And mm -hmm. it looks like the motion is going to have fairly broad support in Parliament, which is fantastic. Um, so if we can get that research and we can get that will to do something about it and get some movement on some of these measures that we mentioned, um, we can hold that company to account because they will be based in Canada and they own nine of the top 15 free porn sites online or top porn sites online. In wow. fact, I think they own all of the most popular ones. Um, something else they have, our, our child pornography laws say that, you know, if, if whether the person is under the age of 18 or not, if they're even depicted to be, it's illegal. Okay. So if you go to most of the, don't go to most of these sites, but right on, you know, the main pages, mm -hmm. you have, you know, the top searches are teen, mm -hmm. stepdaughter, um, babysitter, those kinds of things. So whether I believe some of these girls actually are underage, but whether they are or not, they are dressed up and made up to be and depicted to be underage. That's fully illegal in, Can in Canadian law. So 
we have some opportunities, I think, with, um, with this company moving to Canada. And if we can get the political will and the public will, we can hold them to account for some of this stuff. And I think the hope um, for us, I think, as we've been kind of in this for a number of years, mm -hmm. it is really hopeful to see the conversation happening. Mm -hmm. We're seeing more and more churches who are actually saying, okay, this is an issue. How do we address it? The conversation mm -hmm. is started. We're hearing of more and more great sermons and, and you know, small groups tackling this issue and starting to, to sort of lift that veil off of it and say, this is a problem inside our churches too. How are we going to respond? There's hope because there are all kinds of young people out there who have recovered from serious addictions and struggles with pornography and they're now speaking out and they're helping others and they're you know they're speaking out against this industry so there's great hope in that thank um you. yeah i, I think there is some good news that's great thank you and thank you both mm -hmm. for everything you're doing i mean the canadian church i think owes you a thank you mm -hmm. uh so we'll continue to stay tuned with uh, both of you and your work together um, thank you for joining us today, uh, those of you who did. For the rest of today, you can subscribe to Faith Today magazine for half price at faithtoday.ca slash webinars, and we often cover uh, this issue and others like it. You can find out about upcoming webinars and watch previously recorded ones on topics like these at the efc.ca slash webinars. So thank you very much for joining us. Uh, you can watch our blog sites for um, some recaps of today's uh, resource list that we want to share with you. So thank you very much.